away. Move out. are commonplace in the war in Vietnam. Helicopters used as transports, carrying men, weapons, and material, soaring easily over terrain obstacles that would have immobilized ground vehicles. Helicopters bombarding the enemy with rockets. Spraying him with high volume automatic weapon fire. Helicopters as aerial cavalry, swooping down from the skies to achieve the classic effects of speed and shock action, but with immensely more firepower than ground cavalry. Only a few short years ago, air mobile operations was just an experimental doctrine, a concept never tested under actual battle conditions. It was only fitting and proper that air mobile operations should have been first tried in combat by the first cavalry division of World War II and Korea fame. Riding helicopters instead of horses or mechanized vehicles, it was renamed the first cavalry division air mobile. concept of using organic army aircraft to perform the combat functions of wheeled and tracked vehicles was carefully developed and tested in two and a half years of intensive effort at the Army's Great Infantry Training Center, Fort Benning, Georgia. These revolutionary innovations were tried out by an experimental organization known as the 11th Air Assault Division. Its trained cadres and tested equipment provided a major component of the 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile when it was activated July 1st, 1965. Shortly afterward, it received orders to move from Fort Benning to South Vietnam. Its mission, to set up an Air Mobile base in the central highlands of Vietnam. This base was called An Khe. It set many precedents as an air mobile combat base of operations. It was built around helipads. Compactness was a prime element in design. To make the base as impregnable as possible, it was encircled by a cleared strip 100 meters wide. Howitzer batteries were dug in, ready to deliver pre-planned artillery fire on potential enemy mortar sites. Outposts of riflemen and machine gunners dotted the perimeter of the base on watch day and night, while combat patrols scoured the area on foot. Within the base, military police manned additional checkpoints and barriers. Another security force was posted on top of a mountain overlooking the base. Because of this strong web of defenses, Anke could be protected by a minimum number of men leaving the rest free to hunt down the enemy. So highly trained and motivated was the division that the RK base, serving every type of fixed wing and rotary aircraft, was completed in record time. The Army's first air mobile division was ready to prove itself in battle only two months after being sent to Vietnam. The division was given a vast tactical area of responsibility, ranging from the South China Sea to the Cambodian border, and approximately 150 miles from north to south. Only certain parts of the coastal plain and nearby valleys were built up and populated. The interior of the operational zone was sparsely settled. Its highlands and mountains were thickly covered with jungle and forest. Into this wild, rugged environment, wholly favorable to a wily enemy skilled in guerrilla warfare, 
the Sky Cavalry launched its first air assaults in September and October of 1965. These engagements with the enemy proved that the helicopter had brought remarkable new advantages to the strategy and tactics of ground warfare. Greater mobility for infantry forces and supporting artillery. Additional firepower, quick firing howitzers on the ground were supplemented by aerial rocket artillery. as well as high-volume machine gun fire. Reconnaissance by fire gained in effectiveness when door gunners swept suspected areas of concealment with machine gun bursts. The enemy was provoked into shooting back, thus revealing his presence and location. Command posts could be made air mobile so that unit commanders were able to direct air and ground attacks from a vantage point right over the battlefield. Equipment damaged in the field could be retrieved by air, swiftly repaired and returned to battle. Logistics operations were speeded up enormously. Vital cargo was delivered in record time, right into the hands of troops in the battle zone. Helicopters as flying ambulances saved many lives, carrying the wounded from firing line to field hospital, sometimes in a matter of minutes. All these advantages of air mobile warfare were confirmed in the first days of combat. This early baptism by fire gave the division invaluable experience for its first major engagement, the Play Coup campaign. This was to have historic significance. For many years, North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces had been operating with impunity in the area of Pleiku province. Secure in a remote sanctuary near the Cambodian border, a North Vietnamese army division was getting ready for a major offensive. This was to be a powerful thrust eastward with the ultimate objective of cutting South Vietnam in two. The first step in this plan was carried out on October 13th, when the North Vietnamese 33rd Regiment attacked a special forces camp at Play May. This attack was meant to lure the South Vietnamese into sending a strong relief force to the aid of Play May. Another North Vietnam Army Regiment, the 32nd, was waiting in ambush along the line of march. The trap was sprung on the unwary Arvin troops on October 24th. It almost succeeded. However, the South Vietnamese fought back strongly, even though taken by surprise. The first cav was called to the rescue. Air assault infantry was rushed into the jungle to secure an artillery landing zone. They were sent from the division's advanced command post at Pleiku to an area close to the ambush site north of Plane. Known as LZ Field Goal, this area was immediately occupied by artillery flown in from Pleiku. These guns supported the Arvin troops in their effort to break out of the ambush and protected the relief column when it resumed its march to Play May. At the same time, another battery harassed the North Vietnamese 33rd Regiment attacking the Special Forces camp. This shelling was so accurate, the NVA broke off its siege and withdrew to the west. As a result, the Air Cav's limited role was changed. By order of General Westmoreland, it was sent on an all-out offensive to find and engage the enemy, thus blocking further attack plans. Air Cavalry squadrons promptly searched large areas west of Plane, seeking out communist forces concealed in the lush foliage below. 
Helicopters swoop down to skim the ground at low level, sweeping the landscape with reconnaissance by fire to provoke the enemy into revealing himself. Next, infantry battalions were air assaulted deep into North Vietnamese strongholds. The rifle companies were dispersed over several landing zones. Each company set out patrols to search aggressively for the enemy. On November 1st, 1965, the Sky Troopers hit Vader. They attacked and overran an enemy outpost on the Yate, the Tay River. A full-size battle erupted when the North Vietnamese Army threw in a battalion of men against three air cav platoons. However, helicopter troop carriers took out night and day, pouring reinforcements onto the battlefield. It was a brilliant display of the air mobile ability to replace combat-weary and wounded soldiers with fresh troops. Assisted by deadly accurate artillery support, Air Force tactical strikes, and aerial rocket artillery, the troopers chopped up the NVA 33rd Regiment that had besieged Plaine. The enemy was forced to withdraw to its base camp at Anta Village in the Yadrang Valley. The North Vietnamese were stopped cold for the moment. The first cab continued to push westward in its relentless search for the enemy, licking its wounds in its hideouts in the Yadrang Valley. As part of this continuing search, a battalion of Sky Troops flew into a tiny landing zone, soon to be famous under the name of LZ X-Ray. LZ X-Ray was a clearing deep in the valley of the Yadrang and located at the foot of the mountains of the Chupong Massif, in the very heart of enemy country. The NVA, reinforced by units of the newly infiltrated 66th Regiment, made an all-out effort to destroy the Air Cav Battalion. Their idea, evidently, was to make X-Ray the scene of a miniature Dien Bien Phu. They had not reckoned on the valor of the Sky Troopers, who fought all the more fiercely when units were cut off and temporarily isolated from their comrades in arms. Nor did the enemy understand how the seemingly unprotected infantrymen could call in the support of air mobile artillery with such unbelievable speed. Shelled incessantly, blasted by aerial rockets, seared with fiery strikes by U.S. Air Force fighter bombers, the NVA was drenched in a rain of fires that decimated his attacking forces. The Sky Troopers had to pay a price, but they had turned the communist plan into a disastrous nightmare. The enemy losses in dead and wounded were tremendous. Once more, the enemy survivors withdrew to regroup their broken units, but they were hounded by demoralizing B-52 raids that pounded them in their mountain strongholds. The X-ray victors were ordered to get out of the way of the B-52 bombings by marching overland to two landing zones. One was an artillery landing zone dubbed LZ Columbus, and the other was for helicopters, its name LZ Albany. The Columbus-bound unit reached the LZ without incident. But the troopers bound for LZ Albany ran headlong into a strong enemy column marching to attack the air mobile artillery at LZ Columbus. A fierce firefight resulted. 
it was, in the end, another disaster for the enemy. By November 24th, the NVA was recoiling in defeat, abandoning its camps in the Yadrang and the Chupong Mountains. They retreated, taking their wounded with them. Left behind were almost 2,000 enemy dead and prisoners, plus large stores of supplies and many weapons. The Pleiku campaign, better known to first Cavmen men as the Battle of the Yadrang Valley, was over. Its effect was profound and long-lasting. The American victory proved that the best of the enemy forces, North Vietnam Army regulars, could be stopped cold and destroyed in their own sanctuaries. No longer could the communists hope to win the war on the battlefield. Most important to the men of the 1st Cavalry Division, Yadrang had proved beyond question the soundness of the air mobile approach to ground warfare. It was a well-deserved award when the Air Cav received a presidential unit citation for the entire division and its supporting units. An award so rare, it had been made only five times in Army history. The division's main thrust in 1966 turned toward the central coastal region of South Vietnam, particularly in the area of Bong San, a town which gave the campaign its name. Strong air mobile forces carried out a lightning series of forays against the Viet Cong, who held over 140,000 people in subjection. Each operation was carried out with polished efficiency, using tactics now thoroughly tested in battle. Devastating pre-strike bombardment by Air Force fighter bombers. Attached supporting artillery. Gunships darting in to strafe the landing zone perimeter with rocket fire. Automatic weapons. Infantry assault waves rushing from troop carriers to set up a defense line on the LZ perimeter, while succeeding waves of riflemen advanced through them. Beginning with an airlift into the An Lao Valley, the troopers pushed through all kinds of terrain in their pursuit of the enemy. They rooted out the VC from well-camouflaged nests of bunkers and tunnels. The fighting was bitter, and casualties inevitable. By the spring of 1966, scores of villages had been flushed to the enemy, and hundreds of suspects identified for questioning. The immediate threat to Bang San and other coastal cities was ended. In the operations that followed during the rest of the year, Thayer, Pershing, John Paul Jones, Paul Revere, and many more, the first Cav, often working with Arvin or Korean troop, continued to clear the huge rice-producing province of Binh Binh of VC control. The cavalrymen took time, whenever they could, to feed the liberated South Vietnamese, who had been stripped of their crops by the Viet Cong. Many Vietnamese received medical care for the first time for ailments that had afflicted them all their lives. The speedy air mobile assault of the 1st Cav brought impressive results as many NVA soldiers surrendered, bringing large quantities of their weapons with them. With every operation, the 1st Cav continued to improve its air mobile techniques. One lesson learned was to travel as light as possible. Troopers carried only weapons, ammo, and two canteens of water, depending on helicopters for further supply. The artillery learned how to be weight watchers, too. The M102 version of the 105 millimeter howitzer was 1,200 pounds lighter than the earlier model. Bulky radio equipment was scaled down in size and weight. 
this assembly of two radio sets and an intercom was reduced from 600 to 150 pounds. Collapsible fuel bladders, each with a 500 gallon capacity, replaced metal containers and were air transportable. This technical ingenuity, always air mobile oriented, paid off as operations rolled on into 1967 with Pershing, Wheeler, Jeb Stewart and others. The pressure on the enemy never relented as the choppers took to the air day and night in foul weather as well as fair. Nowhere in this wild, trackless country was the Viet Cong safe from air mobile probes. They were pursued deep into the jungle, sought out high on mountaintops. They were challenged in their most distant hideouts. It made no difference that the first CAV men who had come to Vietnam in 1965, the original first team, had all been rotated home. It was a completely fresh division now, but it was still very much the first team. They took over with smooth professionalism, planning each operation minutely, then lashing out at the Viet Cong with swift, stunning air assaults. The most battle-hardened enemy troops broke under the rain of fires that lashed at them incessantly from the air. And from the ground, as giant 8-inch howitzers reinforced the air mobile batteries. Throughout 1967, the first CAV troopers constantly took the initiative, showing that they too could use the cunning arts of guerrilla warfare, stalking the enemy across rice paddies, swamps, through jungle and forest, frequently stopping to slug it out in one firefight after another, virtually toe to toe, breaking his will to resist destroying him when he took refuge in tunnel or bunker. The toll among the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese rose steeply, with a record number killed in Operation Jeb Stewart, while scores of others surrendered. It was a grind, but only the troopers' feet tired, not their fighting spirit. They were heartened by the armor that joined the ground forces whenever terrain allowed. Armored personnel carriers and foot soldiers spraying enemy positions with machine gun fire, small arms, grenades. These spoiling actions kept the enemy off balance, forcing him repeatedly to abort attack plans. chose to fight because of superior numbers. The first CAV poured in reinforcements with air mobile swiftness. This quick reaction capability paid off early in 1968. When the Viet Cong launched its Tet Offensive against South Vietnamese cities, diversionary tactics to pin down first CAV units were quickly thrown back by the fast-moving, hard-fighting Sky Troopers. Not long afterwards, the Air Cav men played a major role in the relief of Khe Sanh, where a Marine regiment and South Vietnamese troops were encircled by North Vietnam Army units. To remove them, elements of the 1st Cav were committed to Operation Pegasus in April of 1968. Jumping off from an advanced base at LZ Stud, the Sky Troopers set out to link up with the defenders of Khe Sanh. Resistance was light. The air cavalrymen easily broke through and found Quezon to be a very dusty place. When the dust settled, it was business as usual for the sky troopers. The aerial supply chain went into high gear. Attack plans were made with the usual first cab efficiency. The troopers went about the job they knew and liked best to engage the enemy, harass and punish him with firepower. 
Then, fearlessly closed with him, storming the bunkers and strong points with which he had surrounded the Marine base. This cleanup operation was pursued vigorously into the summer of 1968, when Kaysan, having outlived its strategic usefulness, was closed down. The northwest corner of South Vietnam, where Kaysan is located, has a long, irregular border in common with Laos. It is ideal country for infiltration. The North Vietnamese were quick to move troops and supplies into the remote Ashao Valley via the Ho Chi Minh Trail. High in the mountains, the valley is covered with a triple canopy jungle, 100 feet tall, and shrouded in fog and mist 10 months of the year. This near-perfect sanctuary was broken into by the air cavalrymen in the spring of 1968. The flying troopers coordinated their battle actions with paratroopers of the 101st Airborne Division and the South Vietnamese Army. Murderously heavy fire from high-altitude anti-aircraft guns attempted to turn back the Ashaw invasion. Several aircraft were lost, but the troop-carrying choppers made their touchdown. The cavalrymen found an extensive road net, but few signs of the enemy in person. There was little resistance. The North Vietnamese had literally run for the hills. The cavalrymen consoled themselves with the knowledge that they had captured, virtually intact, one of the greatest storehouses of weapons and war material ever assembled by the communists in South Vietnam. The air cav met each blow with lightning swift counter blows, sending its air mobile power ranging far and wide to support other units of the Allied forces in combined operations. Confident in its brilliant battle record and the success of its air mobile doctrine, now accepted throughout the United States Army, the 1st Cav continues to serve far from home as long as needed. The pioneering days of air mobile operations are past. Changes and improvements impend. Bigger, more powerful Army aircraft promising even more effective helicopter tactics. In these advances, the 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile will, as always, lead the way. War in Vietnam has many faces. It isn't just a simple matter of locating and destroying an enemy who hides in the jungles of this Asian nation. There are human needs to be met if the people of this land are to fulfill their destiny as a free society and the ultimate real victory is to be won. Helping the people of South Vietnam to achieve their goals of enlightenment and a democratic life is one of the major objectives of our army. I want you to explain to them that we have two kinds of democracy. 
thermometers here. We have the oral thermometer, and we have a rectal thermometer. Explain to them, please, that we have oral thermometer and rectal thermometer. Our nation-building programs are causing more and more Vietnamese to turn their backs on the communist-controlled Viet Cong. The enemy devotes increasing effort to prevent our programs from succeeding. These are the men of the U.S. Army's 25th Infantry Division. Their task in Vietnam is twofold, to defeat the enemy on the battlefield and to carry out effective civil assistance for the people of this war-torn nation. Today, the men of the 25th, the Tropic Lightning Division, must live up to their honored motto and be ready to strike. The 25th Infantry Tropic Lightning Division was activated at Schofield Barracks, Hawaii on October 1, 1941. Composed of organizations which had been in Hawaii since 1921, the 25th is known as Hawaii Zone. Training exercises for the division in the Hawaiian Islands area during the early 60s were concentrated on jungle fighting and were reminiscent of the Tropic Lightning's bitter battles on Guadalcanal in 1942 and the historic Philippines campaign of World War II. By 1965, the division was slated for service in Vietnam training was intensified for these veterans of the Korean conflict. In December, deployment of the 25th Infantry Division to Southeast Asia began. First to leave Hawaii were the men of the 2nd Brigade. Responding to the request of the U.S. Military Assistance Command in Vietnam, this unit of the 25th departed from Hawaii by sea. Once again, the Army's ready force in the Pacific was being called into action. The 6,000-mile voyage ended on January 15th at the port of Vung Tau in South Vietnam. As the men of the 2nd Brigade came ashore, they were greeted by General Westmoreland, the U.S. military commander in Vietnam. It was the beginning of a new year and a new chapter in the annals of the Tropic Lightning Division's colorful history. During the next few days, the 2nd Brigade moved upcountry to the Kuchi District, some 20 miles northwest of Saigon. Day and night, more than 600 vehicles rolled through the little village of Kuchi as the convoys headed for the division's campsite on the outskirts. the division's 3rd Brigade had begun arriving from Hawaii by airlift. Their destination was Pleiku in the central highlands of Vietnam. This was to be the 25th Infantry Division's forward base, while Ku Chi would be Tropic Lightning headquarters. Called Operation Blue Light, the airlift of the 4,000-man 3rd Brigade by the U.S. Air Force was completed in record time. Eight days were shaved from the schedule as the brigade's men and materiel were delivered to play coup in the largest airlift ever attempted. A few days later, on the 19th of January, 1966, division support elements came ashore at Saigon Harbor and moved up to Ku Chi. Two-thirds of the Tropic Lightning Division was at home in Vietnam. Men of the 25th, the first major assault upon the enemy came with Operation Garfield. From Pleiku, units of the 3rd Brigade were flown southward to Darlak province 
and the Viet Cong infested area around Ban Mi Tu. It was the beginning of a month-long sweep of the province. The VC were difficult to pin down, and the searchers were plagued by hidden snipers. As the Tropic Lightning troopers pressed forward, the Viet Cong withdrew deeper into the jungle. Whole villages, recently occupied by the enemy, were found to be deserted. Sometimes the dwellings were booby-trapped. All documents left behind by the enemy were carefully studied for military intelligence. Any place where the Viet Cong may have hidden weapons or valuable papers was thoroughly searched. Even the contents of these bags were examined. Time and again during Operation Garfield, the men of the 25th had to re-evaluate their search patterns and objectives. Actual contact with the enemy was confined to small unit actions. However limited, these sudden shootouts in the jungle took their toll of battle casualties. Some of the enemy were taken alive, but many more were killed. Intelligence gathered from the prisoners guided the troopers from Hawaii as their search continued. Many caches of Viet Cong rice were located thanks to information given by the prisoners. The food was later distributed to needy Vietnamese people. Great quantities of enemy medical supplies and surgical equipment were also captured, and the operation concluded as the VC fled. The men of the 3rd Brigade took these enemy supplies with them and returned to play coup. Meanwhile, units of the 2nd Brigade were conducting Operation Kahuku in the area around Kuchi. Supported by armor, these elements of the 25th ran into heavy resistance as they approached the Michelin rubber plantation. Enemy mortar fire rained down upon the advancing armored personnel carriers. Some of the machines were rendered inoperable as a result of the enemy fire. But this did not deter the Tropic Lightning troopers from continuing their advance. As they penetrated deeper into the plantation, the men of the 25th found the enemy dug in with well-constructed bunkers. Dislodging the Viet Cong is never easy. Several hours of combat caused the troopers of the 2nd Brigade Task Force to take casualties. But, in the end, the VC were overcome by superior firepower. And the underground fortifications were overrun by the Americans. Many of the Viet Cong were slain. The remainder fled from the battlefield. This day, the reign of terror for the local people had come to an end. The enemy would not return. On April 29, 1966, almost three and a half months after the arrival of the rest of the division in Vietnam, the 1st Brigade landed at Vung Tho. The deployment of the Tropic Lightning Division from Hawaii to Vietnam was complete. Within a matter of hours, elements of the 1st Brigade were airlifted to Ku Chi to join the 2nd Brigade. Though military operations take much time, the men of the 3rd Brigade established a resettlement camp for refugees in Kontum province. Here, the weary victims of the conflict find peace security, and a degree of hope for a better life in the days ahead. In recognition of the division's humanitarian efforts and its growing program of civil assistance programs, the men of the Tropic Lightning Division were honored at an award ceremony. 
Brigadier General Glenn D. Walker, then the Assistant Division Commander, and other high-ranking staff officers accepted the award for the 25th. Play-Me area was the scene of a major effort by the 25th Division and some elements of the 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile to clear the Viet Cong from the district. Under the code name Paul Revere, the full-scale operation took place some 40 kilometers from the Cambodian border. In this determined drive, heavy armored elements of the 3rd Brigade were called up and joined in the massive sweep. Everything in the book was to be thrown at the VC on this one. The activity grew at a feverish pace, and the task force began to move. In the forward areas overlooking the Yadrang Valley, artillery and heavy mortars were flown in. Fire bases were set up, and suspected enemy positions were zeroed in. Now airborne, the assault troops of the brigade were headed into action. Preparatory fire support began. Despite the heavy shelling, the dispersing Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army units managed to shoot down one of the American helicopters. However, the U.S. troops continued to join the battle. Doggedly, they pursued the fleeing enemy into the deepest jungle. All over the northwestern part of Pleiku province, the tropic lightning sweep pressed the enemy ever backward as Operation Paul Revere concluded. Because of valuable lessons learned about the enemy's tactics during actual combat, the division established a special training course to teach Tropic Lightning troopers how to ambush enemy troops played by U.S. soldiers during night operations. The deadly Claymore mine is one of the ambush tools which are used by these night fighters. The 25th Infantry Division is well trained on the subject of guerrilla warfare. Major General Fred C. Whalen, who was then the commanding general, felt the men would benefit from special instruction on ways to trap the enemy. Additional measures to deal with the hidden foe were taken as the infantrymen from Hawaii began working with scout dogs. Continuous obedience training conditions the animals and assures their instant response to the handler's commands. In the field, the big 125-pound animals are trained to sniff out hidden enemy personnel in the thick undergrowth. When VC are located, the scout dogs indicate their find without making a sound. The enemy never knows his presence has been discovered until the dog and troopers are upon him. While continuing their combat operations, the 25th Infantry Division, along with all other U.S. Army units in Vietnam, began putting more emphasis upon psychological warfare and pacification programs. Residents of a suspected Viet Cong village are called out for a well-planned pacification festival. Meanwhile, the hamlet has been surrounded by both U.S. and South Vietnamese troops. In a thorough screening process, Vietnamese officials carry out indoctrination of the villagers, assisted by soldiers of the 25th Division pointing out the fallacies of the Viet Cong ideology and offering a better life in exchange for loyalty to the Saigon government. First stage of the screening is the 25th Division interrogation section. Here, villagers are identified and military intelligence gathered. 
After what her husband does. Uh, thì chồng chị làm tài xế không? Ừ, ừ. làm phụ làm lơ đó hả? How old is she? Uh, anh bao nhiêu tuổi rồi chị? À, trong khi sinh mới 17. Dạ, à, xếp 18. How old? 17. <cười> How old is she? No, she's not. Oh, chồng chị bao nhiêu? Tôi sinh ngày 1944. Không, Việt Nam. The Vietnamese Information Service is next to process the people of the village. At this section, they learn of the various assistance programs which the Saigon government is making available to the needy of the nation. The sections set up by the psychological warfare teams assist the Vietnamese in distributing literature aimed at politically repatriating the individual with communist leanings. One of the most important aspects of the pacification process is the free medical service given to the villagers. What these physicians and medical aid men do here is long remembered. In the final stage of the screening process, the helping hand section determines the most immediate needs of each family and distributes a wide variety of items considered basic for day-to-day -day living. Pacification festivals like this one are conducted as a joint effort of both the American Military Command and the government of the Republic of Vietnam. Everywhere, the results are encouraging. As the months roll by, the Tropic Lightning Division PSYOPs teams have stepped up their distribution of Chiu Hoi leaflets, pamphlets calling upon the members of the National Liberation Front, the Viet Cong, to drop their communist-inspired activities and realign themselves with the Saigon government. By every means available, the leaflets are disseminated throughout the division's area of responsibility a major campaign to win over the hearts and minds of the enemy within. Promising safe conduct and a life of freedom for those who respond and lay down their arms, the Chiu Hoi leaflets are read by thousands. And the campaign works. Previous hardcore Viet Cong are defecting to the Americans by the hundreds. In their eagerness to start the new life, the defectors offer wholehearted cooperation. They lead our troops to the hiding places of their former VC guerrilla comrades. Each location is systematically searched, then destroyed. In the struggle to win over the dissident elements, one of the most valued aspects of the Civic Action Program is the medical assistance work being carried out by MedCap teams. This is the village of Fuok Hiep, about seven miles northwest of the 25th Division headquarters at Kuchi. The members of this MedCap team from the 25th Medical Battalion visit this village once a week to provide free medical service to its inhabitants. Similar visits are made to a great number of other villages in the district, and the MedCap team has an extremely crowded schedule. Despite the pressures under which these men work, each patient is given careful attention. Well, he, he's got a bad fracture here. He must be maybe the bar in there. You know, he wasn't shot or in an accident. Well, hell, he's he's had a fracture here. He says no. How long has he had uh, drainage like this? And I think what he's got is an osteomyelitis with uh, uh, fistula and chronic drainage. And uh, what we'll do is uh, ask him to come back next week with his parents and we'll try and make arrangements for either go to Saigon to the hospital or up to the the back hospital and we'll get x-rays and see if it uh, can be debrided or maybe just put him on long-term antibiotics.
Do you think he understands? Would you ask him? Do you think he understands to come back? By midsummer 1967, 17 months after the division's arrival at Kuchi, medical teams from the Tropic Lightning Division had treated more than 189,000 Vietnamese citizens. The overall civic action program being carried out by the 25th Division takes many forms. Here at the village of Da Chiang, some 50 miles northeast of Saigon, a number of self-help projects have been launched under supervision of the 3rd Brigade S5 section. Captain Vinan Laux is the officer in charge. Dao Chang is in a position here next to the Saigon River. It comprises five hamlets. We have here a population of about 10,000 people which is approximately two-thirds of the total population here in the Free Tom District. Because of our position next to the village, we feel that uh, we can get in here and do civic action work with the people and thereby reach most of the people in the district. What we try to do mainly is create projects for these people in coordination with the district and village officials that are going to be, number one, long-lasting, and number two, projects in which the people are going to derive a lasting benefit. We, ha we try to get these people, and we have been very successful in getting them to do projects on their own in which we provide materials, technical assistance, and then they do the project. I truly feel that the willing cooperation and the enthusiasm shown by the people here in Dao Chang is a good indication that these people feel secure from D.C. Uh, in the area here, that uh, they want to see their village progress, that, I, that uh, it, we have come a long way in uh, the time that the brigade has been here and has assisted these people. And I think that uh, in time to come, we're going to find these people contributing more and also feeling more secure in uh, their respective areas here. In the final analysis, the United States Army 25th Infantry Division is a combat outfit. In this shooting war, their first job is to hunt down the enemy forces and to eliminate them as efficiently as possible. This is not easily done in the guerrilla warfare of Vietnam's jungles, swamps, and rice paddies. A typical example is Operation Barking Sands, named after a famous beach in the Hawaiian Islands. Elements of the 1st Brigade are being sent out to clear an area in the battle zone suspected of harboring the Viet Cong 2nd Do Mien Battalion, a hardcore guerrilla unit supported by the Hanoi government. is a place with the improbable name of Ap Na Biek, about 10 miles east of the division's Kuchi base. The plan called for the assault force to go in in two waves, landing about 100 yards apart. At the landing zone, the first wave received fire from the Viet Cong and was immediately pinned down. The second wave came in and it too was taken under fire. Trying to link up with the first wave, the men of Alpha Company received fire from the wood line to the back, front, and one side. They kept pushing ahead while the forward observer called in the helicopter gunship for suppressive fire.
It took the men of Alpha Company nearly two hours to link up with the men of the first wave, only 100 yards away. Finally, the Air Force Saber Jets were called in. Operation Barking Sands. A small portion of the war against the aggressors was completed. The little hamlet of Ap Na Biek was taken. From day to day, this is the way it is in Vietnam. As the conflict continues, the 25th Infantry Division of the United States Army fulfills its daily missions of compassion and nation building on the one hand, and the stern duty of ground combat on the other. Whatever the demand, the Tropic Lightning Division stands, ready to strike.